So having reviewed electron negativity and having reviewed the link from chemical formula to Lewis structure to molecular geometry, we're now ready to talk about whether a molecule is polar as opposed to whether just a bond is polar. And again, this is something I hope you had some exposure to before in general chemistry. But the big idea is a molecule is going to be polar if there is a net difference in electron density or electronegativity across not only a single bond in the molecule, but the whole of a molecule. If you have a linear molecule like hydrochloric acid, which only has one bond in it, if the bond is polar, then the molecule must be polar and it's not too hard. But in more complicated molecules, you have multiple bonds, each with their own dipole moment, and you have to look at how all those vectors fit together, or metaphorically, the way all those bond dipole arrows point to decide if looking over the whole surface of the molecule, you're gonna have more electron density at one end of the molecule than the other. So whenever you're asked if a molecule is polar, i.e. does it have a permanent dipole moment, we consider two things. What is the electronegativity difference between atoms participating in bonds in the molecule? And two, what is the molecular geometry? So the idea is that, again, for a linear molecule like hydrochloric acid, this is a polar bond because we have an electronegativity difference between chlorine and hydrogen. Bond dipole points towards the chlorine, but that's also the only bond in the molecule. So for a linear molecule, uh, a heteronuclear diatomic like this, if the bond is polar, the molecule is polar, period. Not too hard a decision to make. But if we have a molecule like ammonia where we have multiple bonds, now we have to look at the electronegativity difference across each bond and we have to look at how the bond dipoles fit together and what that means for the whole molecule. So this is one of the examples I asked you to practice getting your molecular formula to Lewis structure to molecular geometry. And ammonia is a trigonal pyramidal molecule. It's shaped kind of like an inverted umbrella where the hydrogen are kind of the turned out ends of the umbrella, or you can think of it as shaped like a tripod where the hydrogens are the feet of the tripod and the nitrogen is the top of the tripod, we would put our camera right here where the lone pairs sit. So what we have to think about here is each bond, what's the electronegativity difference? Well, you should, having reviewed electronegativity, I hope you're in a position to quickly realize that nitrogen is significantly more electronegative than hydrogen. So your bond dipole would be an arrow pointing towards the nitrogen, delta negative on the nitrogen, delta positive on the hydrogen. So this is a polar covalent bond. If we have a polar covalent bond in the molecule, the molecule might be polar. We have to look at how all the bonds fit together to decide whether the molecule is polar. Just because you have a polar bond in a molecule does not necessarily make the molecule polar because the bond dipoles could cancel out. In the case of ammonia though, they don't. Each of the bond dipoles in the hydrogen-nitrogen bonds points the same way, and we end up for each of these bonds with the negative end pointing towards the nitrogen, the positive end of the hydrogen. And as a result, looking at the molecular geometry, what we then say is it's kind of like adding all these arrows together. This arrow points this way, this arrow points this way, this arrow points this way. That means the negative end of the molecule is here, and the positive end of the molecule is down here. So ammonia is a polar molecule. It has a, ne a relatively negative end, and it has a relatively positive end. It has an electron-rich end, it has an electron-poor end. And that's what makes for a polar molecule. It's a molecule where on average, and again, it's always on average because electrons are quantized, they're everywhere and nowhere in the molecule at any given time. On average, your electrons are going to be here, and they're rarely going to be down here. So what this means is ammonia is a polar molecule overall. It has a partially negative end and a partially positive end. So we would consider ammonia to be a polar molecule. The electron density map would look like this with the blobby red electron dense end above the nitrogen and the blue harder electron poor end around each of the hydrogens. You can also make quick determination sometimes as to whether a molecule is not going to be polar. 
So for instance, if you have a homonuclear diatomic like dioxygen or dinitrogen, there's only one bond in the molecule. In this case, it happens to be a double bond in dioxygen. There's no electronegativity difference in the bond. So the bond is nonpolar. And if your molecule has only nonpolar bonds, it can't be a polar molecule because there's no polarity to any of the bonds. So there can't be polarity to the molecule either. Sometimes though, you can have polar bonds, but a nonpolar molecule. If you look at carbon tetrachloride, Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon, so each of the individual bond dipoles points towards the chlorine. Here's carbon tetrachloride. It has a tetrahedral geometry again, which again is a little bit like an inverted umbrella, where the chlorine is kind of the long-handled stem of the umbrella here, and the rest of the chlorines represent the top of the umbrella turned inside out. So the wind has messed this umbrella up, and it's opened the wrong way around, where the Umbrella part of the umbrella is down here, and the handle of the umbrella is up here. Each of these bonds is polar. Each of the bond dipoles should be pointing towards the chlorine. But just because carbon tetrachloride is, has polar bonds doesn't make it a polar molecule because the electron density is distributed uniformly at each of the chlorines. Each of the chlorines is equally good at pulling electron density, the molecule is symmetric overall, and so the electron density tends to be uniformly distributed around the outside of the molecule, and the electron pore part is hidden in the middle of the molecule. Therefore, from the outside, we see kind of a uniform electron cloud where the chlorines are, and the atom that's electron poor is at the middle of the molecule, making the molecule nonpolar overall. Some other simple examples that I asked you to try on your handout earlier to see if you could still identify polar and nonpolar molecules. As a reminder, just because you have polar bonds doesn't make you a polar molecule. You have to think bond dipoles and how they're oriented to each other in space. So you have to think about dipole moments in bonds and molecular geometry together. Hydrogen chloride, polar bond, and a polar molecule. Boron trifluoride, polar bonds, but a nonpolar molecule, because again, the electron density is pretty evenly distributed around the outside. The bond dipoles cancel each other out. CH3Cl is a polar molecule. There is more electron density associated with this chlorine here than there would be with the other hydrogens bonded to the carbon atom. And so carbon tetrachloride, nonpolar, ammonia, polar. CH3Cl polar, BF3 nonpolar, HCl polar. I've left a few more practice examples. The number one skill that I want you to have by the end of the day is that you can go back, link chemical formulas to Lewis structures, Lewis structures to molecular geometry, and then use electronegativity arguments to still decide whether molecules are polar or nonpolar. If you're struggling with this, make sure you check in with me over Zoom during the recitation time or office hours over the next couple of days, and I'll be happy to help you out a little bit and talk you through the process. It's going to be very hard to spot your intermolecular forces effectively if you can't decide whether your molecule is polar or not. Once you can decide whether your molecule is polar, it becomes pretty easy to decide which intermolecular forces it's going to have. But first things first, make sure you can say if a molecule is polar or nonpolar, and then you'll be in a position to assign it its intermolecular forces correctly. Let me know how you're doing with that. Please check in with me on Zoom during recitation or office hours. This is another one of those skills that it may look simple. You may think that you remember it well, but a little digging often throws up odd examples where you have a tough time deciding. If you're consistently having a tough time deciding whether molecules are polar or nonpolar, get in touch with me, get in touch with our tutors for the course, and get some second opinions and ask some questions about your decision making process. Make sure you can spot polar and nonpolar molecules accurately. Try the, uh, the practice problems at the end of today. They're not for points, they're just to help rebuild these skills. And identifying polar and nonpolar molecules, and I'll see you back here tomorrow.